present presentation. Our guest today is Dr. Logan Jones, a PhD astronomy postdoctoral fellow at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, if there's any other anything else, I should uh, let the folks know about uh, Dr. Jones. Um, please let me know. I uh, did send out a short bio which uh, I know everybody's got had a chance to read. Um, and the presentation is, um, not sure how to pronounce the first part, De Re Metallica, That's what I uh, the recycling of elements in, in uh, galaxies. I know there's an inside joke there, John. <laughs> so. No, nope, not that I'm aware of. No, okay. <laughs> yeah, except for Metallica, of course. Metallica, but, uh... yeah. We can all be considered the master of puppets tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not the Sandman. Okay. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn that over to Dr. Jones. Uh, and uh, I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, and uh, Dr. Jones, you can go ahead and uh, share yours whenever you're ready. And thank you for being here. From courtesy of the NASA Night Sky Network, when they had a meeting with all of the group of coordinators or several groups of coordinators, and I said, hey, we used to be able to get NASA speakers, but we had to pay for their lodging and travel mm -hmm. and, and food and everything. But now that we're doing everything over the Zoom, can we still do that? This is how we were introduced to people like Dr. Jones and several clubs, including Silvera, are taking advantage of it. So mm -hmm. I'm very glad to have you here. Yep. Yeah, no, I'm glad, I'm I'm I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. Um just to be just uh, just just to be just to be sure. So is my screen coming through? Not yet. There it, there is, it is. It is now. Yes. Thank you. Oh, that's unfortunate. Okay, so I I'll, I'll, I'll be flying without my notes nope. that I've written then, so that's fun. That's okay. It's working now. <laughs> cool. Um well, yeah, in that case, hi everyone. Uh my name is Logan Jones and uh as John and Chris said, I'm I'm a, I'm a postdoc at the Space Telescope Science Institute. Um, there really isn't necessarily an, an inside joke regarding the title of the talk that I'm giving, other than uh, I forget who the author is, but I but I believe there's like some old old like Renaissance era manuscript called on on the nature of metals, which in Latin is De Re Metallica. So metals in the sense of like you know minerals and things. Um, but the in, in an astronomical context, that's a very different type of metals, which is going to be the focus of, of the talk that I'm going to give today. Um, I'll be honest, I've done basically zero uh, practice of this, so be prepared for a little bit of Im improvisation um, and, and or discussion. So I, I, did, I do have a, bi a, a couple of um, question breaks built in. So if, if, if I'm going too fast or too slow or just if you're, or if y'all want to talk about various things, like there's like spaces for that built in. I will monitor the chat for you so you don't have to be distracted for it in case any questions come in that way. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so I guess just first, just a brief bit just about who I am and how I got to be uh, at Space Telescope. Um, so I've, 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 I've kind of hopped all over for schooling and now for work. Um, I'm originally from uh, a small town in Arkansas called Alma, Arkansas, population a little less than 6,000. 6, um, one kind of silly pun that I like to note is that it's not pronounced the same as the Alma Observatory, different pronunciation, um, Alma Observatory down in Chile, which is which has been astronomers, one of one of astronomers favorite toys for the last like decade or so. Um, for college, I moved about 45 minutes north up to Fayetteville, Arkansas, where I got my bachelor's in physics, graduated in 2016. Um, after that, I moved to Madison, Wisconsin, which is actually where I'm calling from right now. I'm here to visit my partner, who's still a grad student at the in the same astronomy department that I got my degree in. Um, so yeah, lived lived here for five years for for about five years while I got my master's and PhD in astronomy. This is just a picture of me on the right. That's me and some some of my astronomy friends at a sit-in on campus. On the left, that's me at at a in, in the a room in the astronomy building, where 
like those three monitors back there that is a remote remote setup to control or partially control uh a very large like research grade telescope out in Arizona so being able to 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 do like thesis research without actually having to physically travel to Arizona which is kind of nice um but also not nice <laughs> um and then I, I wrapped up my PhD work in August of last year uh, and moved to Baltimore for a postdoctoral researcher researcher position at, at Space Telescope, um, where I've been slowly ramping up uh, a relatively new area of study compared to what I did, what I had done for the previous five years for my PhD work. Um, I really have no context for this image in the upper right here, other than it's just so fun and silly. Um, it's the power of James Webb and, and HST working together to, you know, understand the universe. Um, so the, my tip, a, a typical day being, you know, being a, a research astronomer is, is not always super exciting. It's lots of reading, lots of writing, um, kind of typical office job situation. Um, but on, on the days where, where you do get to go out like to a mountain to do observing, it, it can be kind of exciting. So I've spent a lot of time as, as a graduate student at Kitt Peak National Observatory down in Arizona. Um, so we have summer edition and winter edition here. Um, and then also as, 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 a, as a grad student, hopefully moving forward as a postdoc eventually, I'll also be spending some time uh, at, at the telescopes over in on the Big Island of Hawaii. Um, so we have Mauna Loa on the right, which is kind of like the second, you know, second tallest mountain a uh, far lesser amount of funding for those telescopes than the ones on Mauna Kea. Um, I, 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 I do also just want to note very quickly that um, as, as exciting as it is to actually physically go to these places, um, I, I guess just like emphasize that, that, that we are just kind of visitors to these places that, 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 and like we're only able to use these sites by the grace of like the people whose land they are built on, you know. So for the for Hawaii, it's the Hawaiians. For Kitt Peak, that's the uh, the Tohono O'odham Nation. And for Space Telescope itself, that would be the Piscataway people. Um, so, just wanted to make a note of that, and I guess and like uh, acknowledge that um, we are working on their land. And so, moving forward, uh, we we, we, we um, yes. Just for a note, because you just went to all the trouble to mention that. A common convention that we have now adopted because mm -hmm. of some of that pressure on Hawaii is mm -hmm. that Mauna Kea is now one word with a lowercase k, going back to the conventions from many, many years ago. That's 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 that is fair. That that is something that I feel like I've seen in 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 like published like scientific papers and, and it's it's been but I, I I wasn't sure which is the correct, but thank you. I appreciate that. You're more than welcome. Um cool. Um, so the, a, a big focus of what I'm going to talk about today is metals, um, which may not necessarily mean what it, what, uh, what it means, uh, in, in the everyday sense. So y'all probably remember something like this from, from like high school, uh, just quite, kind of pretty normal periodic table, all the different like columns and types of elements and such. You got your like transition metals, basic metals, semi-metals, uh, noble gases, et cetera. That's too much. So instead, instead we have hydrogen, we have helium, and everything else, <laughs> um, which collectively is just referred to as metals. Um, but that all, but like, like as 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 as, as silly as it, as it might sound, that actually that that does kind of obscure a lot of information about where these elements come from. So. Um, I really like this graphic. This this shows uh, all the different elements and color coded by proportionally what process contributes, like proportionally to that, like their production. So, for example, most of the universe is like pretty much all the universes. Hydrogen is primordial. The majority of the universe's helium is primordial. But but then you see those kind of yellow and green squares. That means there's like some amount that comes from dying low mass stars and a small amount from exploding massive stars. The really heavy elements all come essentially from like either dying low mass stars or from neutron star mergers, um, etc. Um, whoops, there we go. 
Okay. As, so for where, as for where, as for where, did someone say something? I heard someone, but I don't know if they just weren't muted. Oh, cool. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, as for as for where these these elements come like come from and where they go, um, the life cycle of a uh, an atom heavier than helium. It, I mean, it's, it's it, it is a cycle. So there's no really like where you start in this diagram is kind of arbitrary. So I'm just going to start at the top and go clock and go counterclockwise. So supposing you begin with like these kind of coolish clouds of atomic gas, which is by number, mostly neutral, neutral hydrogen atoms. Um, and by cool, I mean of order 100, 100 Kelvin, which is about minus, I think, 280 Fahrenheit. Um, so cool, but not cold. Um, over time, as those clouds kind of swirl around and cool and condense, they are going to um, condense down into Earth. The atoms are going to be able to bond with each other to form molecules, so molecular hydrogen, or if there's any kind of trace elements in there, like carbon and oxygen, they can they can form bonds to form carbon monoxide. And those clouds are typically of order 10 Kelvin cold or warm, whatever you want to call it. Um, those molecular clouds are also going to continue to kind of um, swirl and radiate away their energy and condense and collapse until eventually they get so dense that they become self-gravitating and that is when they begin to collapse into stellar cores and like ignite as stars um as 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 those stars are born however and as they start like pumping energy back into their surroundings um the light they emit is actually going to is, is going to start to kind of dissolve what remains of their parent cloud um and so that's kind of this these lower two lower left two steps here um the very massive blue stars um do the, do, do this most efficiently so they heat up the surrounding atomic gas and strip it st and strip the atoms in it of some of their of some of their electrons and, th and this gas is of order like 10,000 kelvin so 10,000 ish fahrenheit or so um as these stars begin to die off they go you know massive ones first so anywhere between like one or three million years of you know a normal lifespan for the most massive stars versus several tens of billions of years for the very small red stars. Um, this this is this is this is an example of kind of that second step I said before of the massive blue stars ionizing their surroundings. So this is the bubble nebula. This is I, I think it's an H. Uh, what's called an H2 region in the Milky Way. Um, I, th I believe, yes, okay, so this kind of purplish star in the middle is the engine that's powering this kind of bubble of emission. Um, this is this is where the photons are encountering, uh, are starting to encounter neutral hydrogen, strip, and, and oxygen, other things, strip away their electrons, and then at some point it reaches it reaches this equilibrium state of just kind of like a shell, like just like a cavity around the star. Um, so as the stars kind of age and leave, they're kind of like the main portion of their life cycle. Some will begin to blow away their outer layers as stellar winds. Others will start to just like straight up just explode as supernovae. Um, and the the gas that gets returned to the inter this interstellar medium in the, through these different processes so we have hydrogen we have helium and then the fusion products which is the metals um that gas is extremely hot like of order a million kelvin um over time however that hot gas will start to you know cool off fizzle away and condense back down again into these uh cool-ish neutral atomic clouds um this is an example of a stellar wind coming from one of these like kind of dying very massive stars um it's kind of biconic like conical outflows of emission coming from the star um and so what this has to do with the metals situation is basically that like the degree to which all these different processes that like 
the time scales on which they happen, the importance of these various mechanisms of like kind of shedding material from the stars and depositing it back into their surroundings, that's going to depend very strongly on the chemical makeup of the stars themselves and on the gas. And in fact, this is something I learned relatively recently is that uh, metals comprise about 1%, only only about 1% of all the non, of all the mass in the universe that's not dark matter, but they are essentially responsible for most of the interesting like unsolved questions in astrophysics, I think. Um, so for example, uh, me uh, metal atoms that have been ionized will absorb the kinetic energy of either of the surrounding gas through collisions and then radiate that energy away as a photon. Um, oxygen and carbon are both very efficient coolants in that sense. They, they're very efficient at like taking the kinetic energy, the heat from the surrounding gas and radi radiating it away as a photon. Hydrogen and helium is not very efficient at doing that. So what that means essentially is that gas that contains a lot of these heavy elements can actually cool much more efficiently. Um, the amount of metals in hot in this kind of hot and warm gas, which is shorthand called metal metallicity, um, is relatively easy to determine from spectroscopy. Um, so, like for example, this is this is just a random spectrum from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, this kind of like smooth, uh, like baseline level of light coming off it uh, as a function of wavelength. That's that, that's just like light from the stars and these like huge spikes of emission. Those are very narrow emission features coming from the various elements of that, uh, from various elements who's those, who, that, who, who those transitions belong to. So for example, hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, um, this one on the far left in the square brackets, O2, that's ionized oxygen. Um, O3 in the square brackets, that's doubly ionized oxygen and so on. Um, as for these stars, um, so because of the process I showed before, stars will kind of retain the memory of the chemical composition of their parent cloud. So if the parent cloud, if, if, if a cloud contains a lot of metals, as it condenses and cools, the stars that form out of it will also contain a lot of metals. Stars with more metals tend to have more powerful winds, so they're more efficient at, at kind of adding this like pushing momentum to the surrounding gas. Stars with fewer metals pr produce relatively more very, very energetic photons, which means they're more efficient at adding heat to the surrounding gas. Um, and this last bullet point here, it's not really, it's not a cause and effect thing, more just a correlation, but um, stars that contain a lot of metals are more likely to host planets. Um, which is which is something I also learned relatively recently. Um, the unfortunate part of this is that measuring the, the metal content of stars is actually very hard. Um, so unlike the gas, which emits very strongly at specific wavelengths, um, the metallicity of stars is really only, only uh, able to be measured from their absorption lines in spectroscopy. Um, so again, this upper upper kind of black line here. This is a this is the the spectrum of a star from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Um, we see the, the kind of baseline level of emission from the star as this kind of smoother rising curve, and then all these little little dips in brightness corresponding to the different elemental transitions. So calcium on the far far right here, um, a mess of hydrogen features on, on the far left, et cetera. Um, and we're only able to really see these very clean dips and brightness because of how bright the star is to begin with. If it, if it were much dimmer, or if your spectral resolution were chunkier, these, these, these dips would be less obvious and it would look something more like this kind of uh, hand-drawn squiggle <laughs> that I have down here where it's not obvious where, you know, which one of these dips is like a real drop in the brightness due to these absorption features, or if it's just, you know, 
noise fluctuations in the data. Um, and so for that for, for that reason, getting medallicities of stars, especially far away from like outside the Milky Way, has traditionally been a little bit difficult. Okay. That was a lot to throw in the first however long I've been talking, 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'm gonna stop for a second for discussion and questions and such. I don't have anything in the chat right now, but if you'd like to either raise your hand or use the hand emoji thing in, in uh, reactions or type a question or just speak up, now's your chance. Could you go back to the previous slide? Yeah, which one? The, the yeah, this one. Um, sure. I'm not sure I understand what the uh, the the dark red line signifies. Could you just talk about that a little bit? That that was that was my attempt at showing um, at kind of tr trying to illustrate very crudely um, a low quality what, what a low quality spectrum of a star might look like. Um, so um, okay, so non -metal basically, rich star. Say again. A non metal rich star. Not not necessarily that even just that just that um for example if if this if this particular star that that the Sloan Sky Survey was was looking at were ten or a hundred times fainter than it than it is uh, oh. being able be, being able to get the contrast in this kind of baseline level of emission that you see in kind of the smooth upper curve and then the the bottoms of these absorption troughs for example over here on the on kind of the left end where it says h subscript mm -hmm. beta like the contrast between that feature and the and the continuous spectrum would be much lower and harder to measure at at like a statistically meaningful level gotcha okay yeah. so would you would it be fair to say that it's the uh, the signal to noise ratio that you're if you have good signal compared to the noise as you do perhaps in this diagram Mm -hmm. You can discern where the absorption lines are, but if the if it does not, if, if the signal does not exceed the noise, the ambient noise, then it's very difficult to, to parse out. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and for that reason, and that's something that I kind of attempt to touch on later, is that that, that that's one reason why a lot of um, research that's going on these days with, for example, James, the James Webb Space Telescope are focused so much on um, these emission line spectra of the gas because it's it's a question because the, these lines are much brighter than the underlying stellar, you know, the then the stars that, that power the emission are actually much fainter than the lines relatively um, that come from the gas surrounding them. So you can actually learn it's actually easier to do these kind of measurements of getting for example um how much h how much h alpha light is being emitted by this gas that surrounds a massive star um it's much easier to get that estimate than it is a handle on the actual nature of the stars themselves oops so you said that there's a um um, an inferred relationship between the composition of the the, the, the star forming gas mm -hmm. um, and the star. And I, I assume, I, but I'm checking, does that work the other direction? If you know the, the composition of the of the nebula that is the star forming nebula, can you can can you then um, project what the composition uh, the metallic composition of the star is going to be? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I think so that, that that that's actually one of the things that, that I'm, excuse me, that I'm trying to work on with my research is that um, depending on who, depending on who you ask and where and how far away you look, there is a bit of a discrepancy or disagreement on um, whether the metal metal the level of metals and the gas in the stars actually agree. Um, so for example, someone like like someone might look at this like a spectrum like this and using various diagnostics and tools they might infer a certain level of metallicity in the gas they go off and do a similar thing for the stars and say okay is it the same and if it's not why not um 
and so I think that's that that is kind of still an open area of of of, of question questioning. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Anyone? Feel free to continue and we'll keep an eye on questions as they come. Cool, 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 cool. Um, uh, right, okay. So um, for kind of, for, for, for some of the reasons that we actually were just talking about, um, getting a handle on the properties of individual stars, you know, much, you know, much further away than, for example, the, the Magellanic clouds is actually very hard. Um, and so what people often do instead is to use stellar populations, um, which can be either empirical, so like derived from data or theoretical, which is to say like derived from simulations. Um, and, ba and basically what stellar populations are is you take spectra, either real or simulated, um, of a large number of a large number of individual stars for a given age and of a given in a given chemical composition, and then you combine those in like real in like more or less realistic proportions. So usually that means lots of small stars and increasingly fewer stars in um, of you know larger and larger mass. Um, why that's important is that. Um, these like th these different kind of stellar population models will give you or can actually look pretty different depending on um, the metal content that you assume with them. So um, this 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 is this is a, just a quick diagram that I made of in red we have um, a spectrum in the far ultraviolet from about one uh, one thousand to three thousand angstroms. Um, for a star cluster with sun-like chemical composition, sun-like metallicity. Um, and then in blue, we have um, a star cluster of the same age, so three, three million years old, um, but, it, but instead of having a sun-like metallicity, it's one-tenth sun-like, um, so like one-tenth as many metals. Um, and over at the kind of relative, relatively long wavelength then, they they, they're comparably bright. But then as you go to more and more extreme ultraviolet wavelengths, you start to see that the low metallicity stars actually produce like a good fraction, like like fractionally more energetic photons per per star, basically. Um, or per per cluster. Um if I were to have, if I were to have extended extended this diagram to even shorter wavelengths this this kind of discrepancy would actually grow even more um and why this is important is that uh, actually ties back to one of the big uh mission goals for the james webb space telescope which is understanding um the early universe so there's a lot to unpack <laughs> with, with 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 this little cartoon here um we are over at the far right at the present day where when the universe is 13 point something billion, billion years old we see all this like very lovely structure in the kind of cosmic spider web of galaxies we have galaxy clusters we have individual isolated galaxies and then everything in between all the way back like just after the big bang everything was kind of um this uniform soup of particles um and so this trend like understanding understanding the the when and the how of this transition from a smooth particle soup to this kind of very clumpy webby structure is something that's that's being actively looked at um because go, going from kind of from left to right across this image and across time from, you know, the first 300 or 400,000 years of the universe up to the most recent, you know, 13, 14 billion. Um, there's a lot of different like changes that happen as you move from left to right across this image. Um, 
not only do you have the structural change from kind of smooth and uniform to clumpy and complex, you have um, you have chemical changes in the sense of like, you know, the modern universe is very chemically complex. There's everything all the way up to atomic numbers of a hundred and something at this point. Um, versus in the early universe, it's essentially all hydrogen and helium. Um, and then and then the last the last transition that happens um, in this kind of like dark ages air area here is um, a transition from uh, from from the universe being electrically neutral to being electrically positive, essentially to being ionized. Um, ba 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 basically, after a after after things kind of settled down from the from the Big Bang, everything was relatively calm and cool um all of the all of the kind of all of the hydrogen ions that had been whizzing that had been whizzing around found an electron everything was neutral um and and the universe just kind of like uh sat around for a while condensing into into into, into the first stars the first galaxies um but then as excuse me as those first galaxies and stars turned on um the old the, the very energetic far uv light they emit would start to like go out and counter this like essentially wall this like just this sea of neutral hydrogen and be absorbed and so suddenly that that meant the light they emit could not actually travel the, the, the could not actually travel terribly far um but then meanwhile fast forward to today and and we know that um roughly 99 percent of all of the non-dark matter material material in the universe is ionized so that kind of sea of neutral hydrogen where it was one proton with one electron that has now become a sea of ionized hydrogen which is just free floating protons and free free floating electrons and so the question then is you know what kinds of galaxies drove that transition um how quick how quickly did it occur um and, and and in what kind of structures did it occur and what i mean by that is for example if you have these kind of clumps of galaxies and stars all acting in unison eventually they will start to carve out their own little bubble around them and kind of the same kind of in the same way as that um the bubble nebula that I showed before. Um, and if that clump of galaxies were, you know, relatively isolated, then that 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 would just be all it is. It would carve out that little bubble um, in this kind of sea of, of, of um, neutral hydrogen, and that would be the end of it. But if you have several of these bubbles kind of like stacked on top of one another, eventually they will start to overlap and generate just like a mega bubble around them. And then suddenly all of those massive stars can kind of work in unison to carve out increasingly larger bubbles. As this happens uh, more and more frequent, frequently, excuse me, we, uh, suddenly you go from having this kind of isolated pockets of relatively clear gas to uh, these, these, these clumpy structures of like partially clear, partially opaque gas and so on um but eventually everything will start to overlap and the whole universe kind of opens up to these to these uv photons and so finding these galaxies that are likely to be uv bright in the very early universe is a major goal of J jwst um this is part of a figure from a a paper that came out very recently from Steve Finkelstein down at UT, UT Austin. Um, each of these are images from JWST NearCam of uh, galaxies at redshifts greater than eight or so, which is to say from the first, to, I think, I think billion years or so of the universe's history, uh, maybe a little less than that. Um, and and you can see for the most part they are they're very tiny like i'm not sure how well the little the little um scale bar in the lower right of each 
postage stamp comes through, but that little white bar in the corner, that is one kiloparsec in scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, essentially, what essentially what what that what that's saying is that these galaxies are of order one twentieth the size of our Milky Way in in radius, but still obviously very bright, very heavily star forming, um, and strangely massive for how early on they uh, for how early in the lifetime of the universe that they are. And so, as JWST continues to collect data from these programs, the questions that like that I and my collaborators and, you know, all the astronomers that are using JWST want to help answer are when did the stars first turn on? Um, how quickly is the interstellar gas enriched with metals? And then how quickly does that gas that has been enriched with metals get recycled into more stars? Um, and kind of tangential to that, do the answers to those previous questions change for gal for very massive or very not massive galaxies do the answers change as you go from galaxies that are kind of in isolation versus in these very dense clustered environments um i thought i had another question break here but apparently not so uh <laughs> i guess i guess i'll pause here for anyone who wants to like uh ask a question I don't have any in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. I guess I'll just um, push forward for now. Um, so I, I've been talking a lot about like what we can learn about um, the chemical composition and the chemical enrichment of galaxies, what, like what we can learn about those things with JWST but that's not to say that we that there's but that there, there's still there's still territory to be explored um with older facilities like like Hubble so for example um and also in galaxies that are very near nearby um things that we've known about for hundreds of years even though they've been very well studied they still have a lot that, that they can teach us um one such galaxy that's that's very near to my heart and to my research research program is m83 the southern pinwheel galaxy um i am interested in looking at the um at, at these kind of very young massive star clusters that are embedded across the face of m83 so pretty much all of these little um pinkish points that you see um those are these kind of ionized nebulae being powered by very young very massive clusters of stars um the research that i do at space telescope is to use uh the uh, is, is to use hubble and specifically one of the uv spectrographs that, that are on board the hubble space telescope to um look to, to to look at each of these at a bunch at several of these star clusters um and understand what uh, basically try to understand what they're like and how they got to be you know <laughs> how they got to be the way they are essentially um understanding um their chemical composition how they relate to the chemical composition of their surrounding gas and so on um and so each of these cyan circles is like uh, a different position a different star cluster for which we have a spectrum of that star cluster so of order a dozen across the face of m83 the reason the reason why m83 in particular is such a strange one to try to understand is that um you know we've been studying these galaxies for th these objects for hundreds of years and we've we've developed all these very wonderful tools for tools and frameworks for trying to interpret what we see either in images or in spectroscopy but these galaxies that have been very strongly enriched uh, enriched by their previous generations of stars often kind of defy those frameworks and break those tools um so for example this th this this is the uh a the, the the ultraviolet spectrum of a star cluster in uh NGC 1313 which is a which is a relatively small spiral galaxy um the UV spectrum is from the cosmic origins spectrograph which is um 
the last instrument to be installed on Hubble on the very last servicing mission, <clears throat> servicing mission back in, I think, 09. I think that was the last servicing mission, at least. Um, the data, the actual, the actual spectrum itself is in blue and gray, and then the best fit stellar population model is in pink. So that's basically to say uh, the model kind of, the, 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 the theoretical stellar population kind of template matches the overall shape of the spectrum, um, which is related to its age and to how much it's being kind of reddened by the interstellar dust. Um, and in kind of broad strokes, it decently reproduces the spectral features from the various elements. So I've kind of pointed towards some of the major ones here with the red arrows. Um, we have a bunch of uh, very deep ones from carbon, this silicon doublet at about 1400 angstroms, um, and then this kind of uh, EKG shaped uh, little bump here from from nitrogen um, that is that is a feature coming from very very massive very young stars blowing away their outer layers um, and you can see it does like it like could it do a better job with some of these features yeah <laughs> but um uh by and large it, it's able to reproduce this kind of like dip down and then this rise up and then it goes back to this kind of smoothly varying stellar continuum NGC 1313 is a relatively it's it's a, it's a moderately metal poor galaxy meaning to say it's uh its metal content is actually even lower than that of our milky way um as a counter example if we instead try try to do a similar stellar population fit of a star cluster in the very dense and very 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 metal rich center of m83 um Whoops. Suddenly we get we get a best fit model that matches kind of the overall shape, which means it's 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 reproducing or the age that the software infers is roughly correct. Um, but the match between the individual elemental like spectral features is terrible in some cases, um, with the most obvious one being, again, this nit this nitrogen feature here um so yeah this this feature is quadruply ionized nitrogen be, being expelled by the massive stars um and you can see it it had us the, like the, these theoretical models which are the pink lines here have no idea what to do um it 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 really just fails pretty spectacularly at um reproducing this dip down this rise up um from the nitrogen in these very metal very metal enhanced environments and so basically all, all all that is just to say is that um our understanding of how these metals alter the behavior of the stars and the surrounding gas remains kind of slippery on all fronts and so i guess to, just to kind of wrap wrap things up um some questions i guess for the next five or ten years as as jwst and hst continue their mission um so there are these relations that have been known about for a while now between um, the metallicity of the stars or the, of the gas and the radial location in the galaxy. So so it's they usually usually that means the gas in the stars is the most metal enhanced in the center and then kind of gradually dips down to lower values at the at the outskirts. Um, and so but the question still remains is like, how do those relations kind of uh begin in the first place like like why why are they that why are they that way <laughs> sort of thing um uh how does the metallicity of a star that may or may not go supernova change the physics of that supernova um there's been a lot of discussion in the last i think 10 years about relatively exotic methods for initiating a supernova from very very uh metal poor stars that that are hopefully going to start getting tested um and put like like put, putting those hypotheses hypotheses to the test with jwst data over the next five or ten years or so and then by the same token uh there's 
a lot of uncertainty about how these supernova change the chemical makeup of the surroundings, um, especially for very metal poor galaxies. Um, supernova are very violent events. Um, and they actually can like the, the, the shock waves they send out can um, create a lot of kind of exotic heavier elements. But in order for that to happen, in, in order, for example, to fuse two, I don't know, argon atoms into, in, into something new, there needs to be argon in the gas in the first place. And so the question is, how, 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 how do these supernova affect the chemical enrichment of galaxies that are, you know, starting at zero, essentially. And then also, I've already kind of hinted at this as something that's been that that I'm that 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 I and my collaborators are working on among a bunch of other people. Um, how much time do metals spend in the various types of gas? So like the very hot and fluffy inter and circle like circumgalactic medium the warm ionized medium that tends to cluster around individual uh, massive stars, the cooler neutral medium that exists between stars, and et cetera. Um, and then how does that, um, how, do, how, how, how does that kind of loitering in the different phases affect the formation of new stars? Um, but then, uh, in, in the meta sense, another like th there's a lot of questions that 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 that, we, that can be asked about like where do we go from here uh, as a field? So um, there are a lot of very obvious use cases that people are doing with JWST right now. Um, there's just been a flood of papers looking at like being the race to the top with the the most distant galaxy, for example, um, which is cool. But at some point, we have to start, you know asking the less obvious questions, essentially. Um, we have to start finding ways to use not only web by itself, but also JWST and HST in conjunction in creative ways. And like, basically, but, but the question I guess is like, what can, what, like, how, how do we do that? Um, and then also kind of looking in the long term, as powerful as HST and JWST are, there are going to be some questions that they can't really answer. Um, and so and so then the question becomes, uh, what do we need to be able to like finally solve some of these mysteries? Um, what kind of space telescope comes next? Um, and so that's what this kind of lower left image is supposed to show. This is an illustration of a concept for Louvex or Louvoir, depending on, depending on who you ask. Um, this is a, this is the next big flagship mission. It's a J JWST like design, so somewhere between six and 10 meter optical teles telescope in space. Um, probably won't exist until the 2050s. So, <laughs> but you know, it's in the works, I guess. And I think, oh, yep, that's the end. <laughs> so I, I'm happy to uh, take some questions now and I'll leave my email up here in case anyone wants to reach out uh, after this as well. There's one in the chat. Chris, do you just want to uh, read it or speak it instead of me reading it? Sure, sure. I'll ask. Um, I'm not sure how really, you know, pertinent it is to everything else, but I, I just, just something interesting that I, I've wondered for a while. I, I've heard for a while that our, our, our own sun um, exhibits a level of metallicity that would indicate that it's a uh, second generation star. Mm -hmm. that there would have been a um you know previous generation of one or more stars in this area um that fed into that um is there would the spectrum signature of our sun support that uh i believe so yes like um so so I, uh, a lot a lot of stars are are uh stars are are, are classified at um in in uh, as either population one, two, or yeah. three. That's essentially a measure of how metal metal enhanced they are. Mm -hmm. Population three stars have never been seen because they are they are essentially stars that are pure hydrogen and pure helium. Okay. Um, they're the kind of things that would only ever exist um, in the very, very, very early universe before um, 
the, their surrounding material are being polluted by these other elements. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not actually sure whether the sun is a population one star, which is the most metal enhanced, or a population two star, which is the kind of middle ground. But yes, it is. It is um, at least a second generation star. Okay. Yeah. So that wouldn't really be that unique then. I mean, it's it's fairly normal mm-hmm. in that case for mm-hmm. for a star of that age. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Just because the universe revolves around our sun, Chris, it doesn't mean that it's anything special. Oh. <laughs> I just uh, have a comment. Uh, you can get online one of these uh, pe- acrylic periodic table. It has all the elements in there except for um, the radioactive ones. Even the gases, they're enclosed in little plastic bubbles. Yeah. Uh, just just Google periodic table, real elements, acrylic. And, oh, that's uh, cool. Yeah, isn't that cool? This was only $55 on Amazon. And you can get a larger one for a hundred. I recommend the larger one. See, <laughs> and, uh, try to put it. You can see the uh, the elements there. It is just so cool. This is nice. To, I have this on my desk, and you know, this is a great mm-hmm. teaching tool for K through twelve universities. I mean, students see the periodic table on the wall, and it's just a poster. But here, it's real and. If you have a little binocular microscope or a, mm. you know, a handheld magnifier, you can really see all these mm-hmm. elements for real, you know? I, Metal I, is the, I, 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 yeah. Yeah. I, so, I appreciate I appreciate that they didn't have the radioactive ones in there. That'd be Oh um, yeah, yeah. They they don't have the radioactive ones in there. <laughs> that that would be a little dangerous, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. What they do is they put a little uh, radioactive symbol, if you can see uh, it closely, like right here. It's all the radioactive symbol. Mm-hmm. Plus, some of these have half lives of, uh, you know, nanoseconds. You know, like some of these. Mm-hmm. You know, it's hard to read them, but but uh, just throwing that out there. I think everyone should have one of these. <laughs> the periodic table of astronomers metals portrayed quite that way with them yeah. having you know the low level you know big bang stuff versus uh, these were the, the low mass stars and these were the higher mass energetic stars is do you know of any place that has a, uh, a, a this kind of table yeah oh, that's that great would, that'd be something we could roll up and pull out or uh i mean to be perfectly honest, I I I took this from Google. Uh, I don't know. Oh. I'm not sure what the source is, but um, but no, like I I I also kind of want want just like this printed out and hung up somewhere, like yeah. on like in my office door or something. Um, a few of us have some of the bigger ones that we use in demonstrations of spectroscopy. Um, you know, even the clear ones were really helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, this is this is special. Yeah, that's <laughs> really nice. Yeah, I, I forget exactly what I what what I Google to to find this, but I'm sure it's not too, right. too terribly hard to find. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a picture of that so I know what it's called anyway. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Any uh, <clears throat> questions that we have for uh, Dr. Jones while we have him available to us, besides just over email? Oh, I had one. Um, could you go back to the, the the slide where you were talking about um, in the early universe where where bubbles um, where, where where material began to create bubbles? <clears throat> yeah, could you just... explain that um, just a little bit more? I, I I've got a feeling I've got a question in there, but I, I just need to interact with the 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 the, the thoughts better. Sure, sure, sure. So. But basically, shortly after the Big Bang, when everything was kind of cool and soupy and like electrically neutral, um, the very energetic UV photons have a hard time kind of moving around. They basically move, you know, not very far before they're immediately absorbed. 
um, and essentially destroyed. Um, and so that that basically is conflicts with where we have what we have in the modern universe where these photons can travel a very, very long distance before being absorbed by anything. Mm. Um, and and so one one of the kind of leading ideas for how this process began of moving us from this kind of neutral or this kind of sea of neutral material to ionized material, which is more transparent to these photons is is that it began Oh, hello. Sorry, my partner's dog just came in, burst in. Uh, <laughs> hi, Roscoe. Uh, is that um, this process began uh, in regions of space where there were a lot of galaxies all kind of clumped together in one location. Um, so not only were they like each each individual galaxy is like forming stars like crazy, like crazy, just because there's so much like gas available and abundant, but then as their kind of individual ionized bubbles start to overlap, um, all those very energetic photons that are being produced in the massive stars suddenly are able to travel a very long distance. And basically all these stars can start to act in concert to pump out radiation to interact with the intergalactic gas. So, um, so the formation of these bubbles, essentially a, a condensation, a gravitational condensation of, of, of matter? They they are they are um, they are centered on very dense regions of matter. Yeah, so like um, they are centered on regions where, or they tend to be at least in the early early universe, they tend to be centered on regions where dark matter is very dense, and so therefore it's more conducive to forming stars, forming galaxies, and so on. Mm -hmm. The bubbles themselves are not necessarily like a material thing. It's just like a boundary between the very hot ionized gas that kind of belongs to the galaxy or to the group of galaxies, and then the kind of greater intergalactic space, essentially. Okay. Um, I, I, I've i always kind of figured that over dense regions in, in, a, in a gaseous medium would, would end up creating a, um, a dynamic where it, it has positive feedback loop where there's uh, more attraction between the, the material, the dark matter and the, and, and the baryonic matter. And, and as it gets more attraction, it gets closer together, which means it has more attraction. And, and that, so, so it's kind of, it has a big sucking motion, which creates a, an area from which that material came that now is, under dense, under densely populated wood material. Does that sound about right? Yeah. So like, um, there's there's tons of these like different simulation suites and like animations that have been made of um, these dark matter simulations. So starting from a very uniform kind of universe, um, and then as you just like let the clock run forward, you start to see exactly what you said. It's like areas that are, you know fluctuating towards being very dense those are areas where stuff starts to conglomerate and that's where we get these, these like really spectacular spider webs of um, dark matter halos um, these dark matter like blobs essentially um, the thing that makes it the thing that makes non-dark matter material different is that dark matter you know uh, it's basically only subject to gravity and so in that sense um it can just kind of like self, you know, self gravitate more or less endlessly, kind of like what you said up to a point. Um, normal matter at some point will start to um, also experience heat. There's like, you know, various like thermodynamics and radiation physics that happen that can exert the opposite kind of feedback. So like the, the very massive like supernova or like massive stellar winds that will start to actually like any dense gas that exists around these very massive stars will suddenly just get like poof, blown back out to being very fluffy again. So I think that's kind of where, where I want, I have a question and I couldn't really figure out how, how to, how to grab a hold of it is mm -hmm. the, the very first generations of stars were probably very hot and, and probably very massive. Yes. 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 Absolutely. Um, and so very short lived. And, and at the end of their lives, they were, they were like super supernova. Um, so, so that would be like the counter pressure 
in at least in um, it, there would be this counter pressure from um, the supernovae uh, that would would work against essentially the, a, a much weaker gravitational force if you don't count dark matter, I guess. That, that, that's where I get confused is how much dark matter plays into that because these all these explosions happen within a few million years of each other and and it seems like they'd be pushing not just their 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 gas shells out but any other gas shells that were around them um, and so it, it kind of really mixed things up in terms of these bubbles it's, I guess that's where I was trying to understand. And right. I, I guess that's where everybody's trying to understand what's what happened. I mean, that 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 is that is essentially all like the only answer I have for that is that like that is kind of the one of the big mysteries coming out at, like as JWST starts to like gather more and more data is that um, people are seeing galaxies that are very bright and very massive, like well past or like like well into the first, you know, maybe 300 or 500 million years of the universe way more than any simulations would have ever predicted mm -hmm. the question is now i guess like yeah like to what extent do um do like does the star formation counter the dark matter kind of conglomer conglomeration and so on um and yeah that's something that's going to have to be be sussed out in the next two or five years or so i guess yeah or fascinating more. stuff and and then with those those kinds of of uh, um those first stars, as large as they were, um, do we have a, do we believe that they, um, that, that the supernova triggered all the way through the oxygen, um, creation of oxygen, or did they trigger before that? Ooh, interesting. I, I mean, so like, I, I, uh, the supernova themselves, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, like I think I'm sorry, iron. I meant to say, not oxygen. Iron. Oh, 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 oh. Iron. Well, so, I, I think, I think, I think, that, I think in general, the idea is that yeah, like these these very like chemically pure stars, you know, they live fast, die young, um, and then, but 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 even for for even for as short as they live, they do manage to synthesize a ton of these heavy elements. Whether whether it's whether that whether that goes all the way up to iron or not or not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Like basically, as soon as in any given like galaxy, as soon as those first generations of stars go off and go supernova, like the next generation of stars to be made um will no longer be chemically pure. Like those first right. that first, that first generation is like productive enough yeah. that the next the, the next ones will be enriched by oxygen, by I don't know, nitrogen, carbon, etc. Yeah. So just kind of thinking through it, the, um, the those very large first generation stars um, probably could not sustain fusion past one or two levels because they're so large that the 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 higher um, the 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 larger elements could not produce enough. A fusion to be able to do out pressure to keep sustain the size of the of the, the, the stellar material. That, that that would that would make sense. Like to be perfectly honest, this is reaching kind of the boundary of 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 of, of what I'm familiar with. Just because not only is it a little outside of what I do for my immediate research, but also my understanding is that um, again, it's it's like such an extreme problem that even the simulation folks are having difficulty actually kind of getting a handle on you know on how these stars behave at these really extreme masses sure yeah I, I, that's i i think though that ult your ultimate question will depend on some of those answers right oh ab absolutely and so it's going to be kind of a, a concerted effort between um not only the observers using you know facilities like web and hst to actually look at the data and like see try to get a glimpse at these first generation stars but also on the simulationists to um figure out exactly what it is that makes them, that makes them behave the way they do yeah and the gas clouds they produce absolutely yeah yeah, yeah, yeah.
Cool. Thank you.